Okay, so this is an introduction to Crypto Econ Lab research, and the agenda for today is uh, I'm going to give a bit of an overview of the research that we're doing, and then I'm going to give a specific example of something we did a couple of weeks ago, uh, and then I'll do a bit of a recap and reflection, so it's it's pretty simple talk. Uh, okay, so to start off with our uh, research uh, overview, I want to talk about the different people who are involved. Uh, so in kind of alphabetical order, uh, the guys involved are Axel, Alex, Maria, myself, Vic, and ZX. And if we start with Axel, he's really the kind of mathematical and kind of analysis and uh, expert, uh, very creative and a lot of good ideas. Uh, uh, Alex, he's, he's our technical program manager, so he keeps us all kind of playing together, keeps everybody in tune and in line. Uh, Maria, Maria's just joined us recently as a data scientist and research scientist, and she has a black, uh, background in blockchain and a PhD in statistical analysis and time series methods, um, picking out anomalies from time series. Uh, so I, I think that that'll be really cool to see what she's doing. I think she's going to be working a little bit with uh, perhaps with some of the Project Saturn uh, work, which we're going to hear uh, later from Patrick. Um, so at the moment, I'm mostly focused on the simulation side, but I try to do a little bit of everything. And Vic, I mean, you've already heard about Vic. He's the kind of uh, business and finance aspect uh, expert in, in research and analytics. And ZX, um, so ZX is the guy with the vision. He's also our workspace admin. He's got a, a separate picture, it seems. Uh, and in terms of people, other people joining, we've got Dave, who's already here, and Juan Pablo, who's joining us in, in another couple of weeks. And I think there might be more people soon, and who, who knows uh, next. So these are the kind of key people who are involved. Um, what are we actually doing? Uh, so. So I can try to break it down into some kind of principal themes uh, and look at different aspects of this. So, I mean, there's a lot of overlap between these things, but, I mean, one way I like to think of it is an aspect is the kind of core developments research. So this is the research that uh, Filecoin and Protocol Labs is doing that's really pushing the protocol forwards. So it's things like Filecoin virtual machine um, and scaling solutions. So, of course, there's teams driving these things forwards, uh, engineering teams um, or crypto uh, cryptography teams, uh, but of course we, we interact with these guys a lot. Um, so that could be, for example, with like uh, with hierarchical consensus for scaling, which is what Axel is working on uh, a lot of the time at the mo moment, really intensely, and he's going to be talking about this a bit later. So there's a lot of really interesting questions that turn up um, whenever you think about scaling solutions on Filecoin. I mean, the kind of interesting questions are, okay, so uh, like, w what should the collateral look like? What should the gas model look like if you've got this kind of hierarchical structure where each, where the root net, the L1, can spawn subnets, and these can spawn subnets? It, it, it uh, throws up a lot of very, very difficult questions. Um, as to what, you know, what are we trying to achieve with the gas model? Is it DDoS resistance? Uh, should it be to support total locked value? Sh should it be to have minimum fees? You know, there's, there's a lot of questions here, which um, Axel will get onto later in a, in a lot more detail. Uh, an another thing we're kind of working on that's a kind of key theme is baseline research. So this is the kind of key parts of the protocol now, keeping these things running, understanding all of the the state of the network really well, how all of the different components interact, and how they might change in the future um, if we were to tune or update any any different parts. So this is things like gas, collateral penalties, and all of this kind of stuff feeds into things like circulating supply. So this is something we're looking at quite a lot at the minute, different scenarios uh, in the future if we were to adapt to anything. Uh, another key theme in our research is ecosystem elements. So this is kind of more on the applied side, building on the fundamental stuff. Uh, so this could be things like perpetual storage, which we've done a lot of work on in the past, trying to think about how does one come up with a price to store something forever. Uh, it's not an easy thing, but you know there are ways to do this. And now this is actually going into production, and there are teams uh, who, who, are, who are making this happen. So that, that's, really, that's really cool. And then another thing, that's, of course, uh, extremely interesting to us and kind of motivates us in the long term. And this is something that Juan talked about um, last month in, in, in Amsterdam at Shelling Point, is this kind of this vision of Pareto-topia and this interplanetary mechanism design. And this is really part of Crypto Econ as well. But this is very long-term stuff. Um, 
you have to kind of put in place the building blocks. And that's what we're doing now. So having storage and having things like Filecoin Virtual Machine to enable user programmability. Uh, I mean, there's, there's going to be massive things that come out of this that will allow us to kind of affect the world in, 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 a, in a quite substantial way. But the, the first step in doing this is being able to organize and understand the data to create, curate it and make it available. So that's what we're doing with projects like Project Atlas, which Ishan is going to talk about later. So that'll be cool to hear. Um, so. Another kind of theme I wanted to touch on a little bit is, is governance. Uh, and to an extent, you might think this is a little bit outside of the wheelhouse of the kind of simulation side of, of Crypto Econ Lab, but you, you, I would say you're 100% wrong if you think that, uh, because go governance is, is everything, and it goes right from control at the very best line level, uh, epoch level, right up to, to what we traditionally think of as governance in terms of FIPS or EIPs or BIPs or whatever. Uh, so, I mean, something Vic and I were talking about a couple of days ago, which I think is a really interesting idea, is this kind of concept of an intermediate timescale governance. So not, not necessarily the control at the epoch level and not something that takes weeks or months. Uh, like FIPS, but something somewhere in between, and using ideas from statistical machine learning uh, to try to to try to to try to select optimal parameters for the state of the network. So if we can define some kind of concept of network health and utility, we can treat this as a black box optimization problem. We can fit some latent probabilistic function and optimize this on a kind of weak to week or even day-to-day -day basis and have a, a human steering level on top of this to kind of approve parameters. So, I mean, th th this is one potential idea. I mean, and there's so many other different things, but I think there's a, there's a lot of work to do here. Um, so I just, just wanted to highlight that. Uh, okay, so moving on to the next thing. So another big focus uh, at the moment. Um, right, so listen, I've told you a bit about the people, I've told you about the projects. There's different aspects, uh, or sorry, I've told you about the people and I've to uh, told you about the themes. I can tell you a bit about the projects. So some of the projects that are receiving attention from us at the minute, there are a few, so Axel's on the HC stuff uh, very intensely, uh, amongst other things. Um, we're looking at a couple of other projects, but one of the big things at the minute is this digital twin development. So, I mean, as ZX says, it, pretty much everything in Filecoin has already been simulated and tuned, and this is how the parameters are picked, and this was done a year or two ago in Austin. But there's always scope to have more models, better models, faster models, that kind of wisdom of the crowd. If we can get many models together, maybe we get a better uh, view. So this is something that we're working on at the minute, is kind of extending our digital twin capacity. So there are kind of some key principles that we want uh, when we're doing this, we want something that's kind of general, that can tackle any aspect of the, pro, uh, the, uh, the protocol, something that can be modular and extended easily, and ideally something that's composable and written in kind of in a pure style. So this is why I'm highlighting Jax, because this is something we'd really like to do. If, if we can, if we can uh, rewrite our digital twin simulation capacity in this kind of pure form, uh, without any side effects using Jax, that this would be very good uh, because it'll allow us to differentiate through our whole models very easily, which is very good if you want to implement things like Hamiltonian Monte Carlo because you want to do MCMC sampling just for fun or because you want to learn something about the system and because perhaps you have some kind of concept of rationality and you want to optimize uh, some agent's behavior in, in the future. So this is the kind of thing that we're, we're working on at the minute. Um, and, as, and as well as uh, pushing our digital twin capacity in this direction, we're also trying to extend things like the sector exp exploration model. So this is kind of tricky to model actually, because it gets a bit complicated because whenever you have a, a sector, it can expire um, after 180 days, 540 days, whatever, sometime in between that, and it can be renewed. And the kind of the pattern and the distribution of these renewals is changing with time. So there's kind of a bit of an art to it. It's like, okay, how detailed uh, do you make it? Um, and you know, you know, a model shouldn't necessarily be, a, you know, a photograph. There is some degree of simpl simplification that's necessary, and this gives the model the kind of generalization performance for the future. So there, there's a, a bit of an art to picking this. 
Uh, okay, so that's a bit of an overview of the research that we're doing. Uh, the next thing I wanted to give was um, a specific example of a little bit of work that we did uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure quite how much time I have, have left, so if anybody can like yeah, give me a shout when there's like two minutes to go, that would be much appreciated. Uh, okay, so a little bit of work that we did a couple of weeks ago was trying to assess uh, FIP uh, 0032. So FIP 32, this is, very, this is quite an interesting FIP um, because it introduces new accounting that's going to happen for... Um, for Filecoins gas, and this is brought in to kind of pave the way for FVM in a, in a, in a few months down the line. Uh, but it's actually going to change the gas usage in Filecoin right now, so it's quite important to understand this and understand what the consequences might be. Five minutes, okay, nice one, thanks. So. So we, we were asked by the FEM team to take a look at this. And okay, so the first thing we think of is, okay, so you're gonna increase the gas usage. So what's gonna happen? Well, you can think about the base fee up, update rule. So ZX already mentioned there's this base fee up, update rule where the protocol is targeting some, some level of block fullness. And if we go above that, right, the base fee is gonna go up. So that, that seems to be the, the kind of simple conclusion. But uh, maybe that's not gonna happen. Uh, and if we, if we look at uh, the gas chart here from Starboard, we can see that actually uh, mo most of the gas usage comes from, from ceiling. Uh, so this kind of brings us along to the next point. Okay, so actually we can batch. So probably it's not going to be a big deal at all. So maybe this is a little bit of a, of a, of a non-issue. So what if the metering increases? Miners can just uh, increase their batching. So it's, it's, it's no big deal. But there's actually a little bit more subtlety to this. So if we, if we look um, at what the changes actually are, uh, you can see the, the changes to the gas usage are listed here. Now, we can try to look at them in a little bit more of a digestible form. OK, yeah, so you can see what, what happens exactly to the gas multipliers here. Uh, so you can notice that the gas multipliers are actually different across the different uh, um, commit gas types. So they're, they're different for pre-commit, prove commit, and they're different for, for, for batching, pre, and prove as well. So this is kind of interesting, and it brings up a, a slightly subtle point. So if we think about when it becomes rational to batch, this is actually something that might be affected because all of the multipliers, they're not raised equally. Some of them go up a little bit more than others, which actually changes the rational batching condition. So what do I mean by the rational batching condition? I mean, uh, at what point does it become rational to batch as opposed to just commit with a single proof, which is, which is given by these expressions down here. Um, and since the, the batching uh, expression accounts for both single and batch proofs, um, it, it depends depends on, on the ratio of these numbers, which has changed. So I feel like I'm getting lost in the weeds to use the excess expression. So we'll move on. But the key point is there's a consideration about rational batching. Um, so what, what actually happens? Uh, what, what happens is, is the following. So we can compute the rational batching decision boundary. And if we do that, currently we're at this orange line, uh, the orange line in the bottom left-hand plot. So that's the situation right now. What happens post uh, FIP32 when it introduces these new multipliers? What happens is that we move up to this blue curve. And because, because the multipliers, there's actually a whole range of potential values that they could take because of the different types, different ways in which the o uh, operation of the protocol can express itself. Uh, because, of, because of this, there's actually, a, 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 there's not one single rational uh, batching curve, but instead we have this boundary. So you can see the kind of key point is, okay, so it's moved up, but it hasn't moved up um, substantially relevant uh, relative to the, to the variation in observed behavior in the back test. So that's the, that's the basic takeaway. Um, so 
the basic takeaway is there's a change, but it's probably not a statistically significant one. But again, this depends on what you understand by the, the concept of statistical significance. But nonetheless, the, the kind of key question is, should we update the parameters in the system? So based on, based on a kind of derived batch balancer parameter that we can derive using certain principles, once we've, whenever we've, whenever we've analysed these new multipliers and the particular distributions that they can take, we find there's not a significant difference. So that's our kind of key finding. There's not a substantial amount of evidence that we should be updating any of the parameters in response to these changes in gas at the minute. But we can look a little bit closer and do some scenario tests. So, okay, so what if the back tests are a little bit off and, the, and, the, and for example, batching gas is actually gonna be two times more expensive than we think? Well, then this would actually shift the rational, rational batching curve quite substantially. Uh, and, and in this scenario, we, we, we might be a little bit more concerned. So the kind of key point, key takeaway is, uh, we don't think uh, there's gonna be any substantial changes as, as a result of this, but if the back tests are not totally representative, then you know this is something we have to be monitoring pretty close, and, and we will be uh, going forwards. So I think that is really the last point I want to make, and those are the kind of key things. So I will finish up there. Uh, so I've given you an overview of the research. I've talked a little bit about some specific research, uh, and, and I was gonna, end on a little bit of a reflection, just to say that there's plenty of room at the top and to show this image. So th this is an image. Um, this is actually where we were staying in Amsterdam when we had our first crypto econ lab meeting last month or so. And this is the site of the world's first bourse or stock exchange. And I just think it's kind of like a good resonance with where we are now in the sense that this is kind of technological improvement and it brought, brought much, much prosperity to Amsterdam and made it the city it is now. And, and I, I kind of feel there was like a good resonance in the sense that the progress that we're making and, and the, in the general direction things are going.